So, welcome everybody here at the Maxon booth um, on the IBC 2015. Uh, thanks for coming here, watching my presentation. And hello, Internet. Thanks for coming as well. Uh, I saw we have a lot of people watching us from the Internet on the stream, so thank you for that. It's cool to have you here as well. So, my name is Glenn Frey, I'm a Maxon employee since 2009, and I'm going through the R17 features. Um, R17 was just released by Maxon, and yeah, I would like to show you what's new and why you need it. So, first of all, um, how are you today? Because Maxon really cares about our customers. How are you? How, how are you? Good, thanks. And how are you? Very good. Very good. Very good is better. Fine. So, um, I'm also very well. I slept well. I missed the party, unfortunately, yesterday. So, um, it's better for today because I'm fit now <laughs> to do the presentation. And before we go into the R17 features, I would like to show you some pictures that have been rendered and done and produced in Cinema 4D in the past year, and but first of all, uh, Maxon's mission, we have a new marketing sentence for that, and it says, to be the outstanding 3D company providing innovative technology, intuitive tools, and customer-focused service to creative professionals worldwide. Doesn't it sound great? What we wanted to say was actually, we care, we listen, and our software is easy as hell. So, um, I know 3D is complicated. 3D software in general is complicated. It's hard to learn, but I can assure you, and that's the reason why I'm standing here and working for Maxon, I can assure you, Cinema 4D is much easier than any competitor because we always try to make sure that usability is our number one point when it comes to creating software. Usability to use it intuitively. That is very important because you have to work with this. And then the next thing is stability. The software has to be stable because when it crashes, you're probably going to crash as well. Because if the software doesn't work and crashes all the time, you're going to be angry because you're working with it. You have to rely on that. And then on top of that, Cinema 4D, of course, is very, very professional. And you will see this just by looking at the next renderings I've collected for you. This is Raphael, he's also a speaker on uh, the IBC 2015 here. And he's a great guy when it comes to lighting and, and rendering metal stuff. And so he's done a lot of great uh, renderings. I mean, also this one here, Ike Sponsa. Manuel is also here talking about Arnold and Seed, the movie that was totally done in Cinema 4D. Watch it if you haven't seen it yet, it's incredible. It's like photorealistic. It's really great. The quality gets better from year to year. When I look at the renderings that we get uh, sent by our customers, it's incredible how good the quality is nowadays. Again, Rafael Rao. I mean, also this one. Again, I sponsor. It's a company located in Munich, Germany, and they work exclusively with Cinema 4D, and they have some uh, external renders. But I mean, how do you come up with this here? If a customer uh, says, "I would like to have something knitted together in in real time," and I mean, I have no clue how they did this here. But it's, it's amazing. The, the result is amazing. And it's done in Cinema 4D. So what else? This one here also very nice look. Totally different from the other ones. Not realistic. A paper look. And this one, again, Raphael. I mean, this guy is crazy. We saw this on a workshop he did. And we were looking at this picture. And everybody was laughing because we thought, when does he finally say that this is a photograph and not a rendering? But he didn't say that. And everybody was looking at each other, and then we finally noticed, okay, he, he's true, he's honest, this is a rendering. 
I mean, look at the details here. There are fingerprints here. There's, uh, it's, it's the, um, the coating is coming off this pencil here. It's, it's unbelievable how he spends time on details, on such small details, which makes it so realistic. And here is the proof. This is the wireframe. Doesn't look very complicated. It's actually very easily modeled, I guess, but the result is incredible. Of course, we also have people that create characters like this here. Pavel Soch, a nice colleague of mine, he also does incredible stuff, also very detailed. This is my colleague Glenn, he's sitting right next to me. and some other incredible work, like this hair. We have a solution in Cinema 4D that creates hair and fur. I mean, look at the result. This is really cool. This girl has done a great job on doing this on the cat, like with a different hair length and, and how this is uh, reflecting the light and the whiskers. Also, I love this one. I love the mood, the color mood of this one here. It's pretty amazing. So every year, beta testers um, give us feedback on the new version before we give it to our customers, of course. And they try to find bugs as well. So they give us feedback. And the feedback, even though this is not the shiny release, our 17 is not really a shiny release where we have this major big features where people just watch it and say, wow. You really have to get into it because it's a total workflow release. But these are features people wanted for years and we had to do this because workflow is important. You save with this release many, many hours, if not days of work. And I just took three features of the release 17 and I don't tell you what feature this is. That's why it's right here. I tell, tell it at the end of the presentation. But I mean, the sentence here, boom. I just love the word boom. Boom is like an impact, boom. I love the <laughs> system. Surely this is one of the best new features for many years. Thank you. And this is also my opinion because I meet a lot of people on trade shows and when they talk to me, they always ask about Glenn, when do fluids come to Cinema 4D? And I'm, yeah, okay. I cannot talk about future development. And then they ask the second question and it's always the same. And that's this feature here. I'm not telling you which one it is. I present it later. And the, the great thing about Maxon is when we do something and we put something in a release, we always put something on top. So the feature that people always wanted is actually only a small side feature of the big thing that we put in R17. But you will see it later. The next feature, feature two, definitely. This is so cool, loving these new additions. This is fantastic, a very welcome addition. Should remove the need to jump between C4D and <laughs> so much. So a lot of great feedback and we're very happy about this because we wasn't really sure how this would uh, um, be taken by our customers because it's definitely only workflow, but I get from talking to customers that workflow is important, saving time, because if you save time, you can save money, and everybody wants to save money. So let's go into the features. Color chooser. We all have to choose colors now and then for our rendering. And we really redid the whole color thing in R17. We have this color wheel, which is a nice addition because you have these handles that you can turn around and then you have these other handles, depending on which mode you choose, that move instantly parallel to the first handle. So you can choose a color and automatically have a uh, color harmony selected for you. Like, uh, um, let's have a look at the, the color pickle, uh, pixel color picker. Um, color harmony, like, um, I'm missing a word here. Uh, complementary color, that was what I was searching for. Like complementary colors, which you can choose right away. So Pixel Color Picker is also a great feature. You load any photo, any drawing, any painting, whatever, into this um, user field here. 
Who knows what this is? Does anybody know what this actually is? Does anybody remember? Monkey Island, correct. I love this game, by the way. So I loaded this picture here, and the great thing about it is that you, if you want to have this color mood in your rendering, it's hard to, how do you find these colors? How do you take these colors and put it in your rendering? Use this detail sli um, slider. You simply decrease uh, the resolution. So you pixelate the picture. And then you can add as many color pickers as you want. And they magically snap to the point. So there's a snapping, so you can snap to any pixel here. And this, you can see, it's the same color mood, but it's pixelated. And then you can choose all the colors. And with every plus you click, you get another field here. And you can add as many colors as you want until you finally have the color mood of this picture. And then you click here and save it in the end. So let's look at the video that explains it a bit better. So the first thing is the color wheel here. So let's look at this, the color wheel. As I said, you've got different modes here. And if you move one handle, the other one is moving parallel to this one. And you've got different modes here to choose from, or you can add them uh, one by one, as many as you like, to create color harmonies like free mode, monochromatic, complementary colors, analogies, and so on. Many modes for you to choose. Of course, we've got all the color spaces that you need, like RGB, HSV, and Kelvin temperature, of course. That's the standard. And now we pick color moods from pictures which in my opinion is the killer feature for this color chooser. I decrease the resolution. You can see that it really snaps. I add as many points as I want and here they appear. So I have all my colors and then I click here, rename it and save it on my hard drive and can send it to anybody. Here, this is the color mode I want. Please use these colors. Oh, I have the uh, color mixer. I choose one color and then another color from a different color picker, and then I mix between these two and choose a color in between. Also pretty cool. And then you have these color swatches. This is your palette, all the color swatches yet that you saved, and you can load them anytime and use them for your rendering. So it's so easy to find colors now with Cinema 4D. Variation shader. What does it do? It creates variations, of course, but this is a feature where people on the beta forum wrote, oh my god, I did this by hand and it took hours. Now it's only a few clicks. Why do you need variations? Look at these pictures here. Sorry. The buttons here, for example, if you want, if you want every button to have a slightly different color, you can do this with a variation shader very easily. You can see they all have a slight different color. Now imagine doing this by hand. Go in there, give this button a different color, create a new material, change the color slightly, put it on another button, you get crazy over this work. So variation shader does color differences on objects, but also texture differences. You can see here this has a different color than this bean coffee bean and it also has you have two textures you can put in there and so they are distributed differently so not every bean in this example has the same texture or these leaves for example there's only slight differences between these leaves but this makes the huge difference between having a picture that looks realistic or having a picture that looks like one color and somebody thinks ah, something is wrong. I don't know what it is. So another tool that helps you to make your renderings even more realistic. Here are the examples. And I also have a small video example or this one here, the distribution of colors on a mosaic. Look at this. You would never do this by hand, but with the variation shader, no problem. So here's the small video. You can see clearly without and with. Here are the colors. Look at this leaf here. Now you can see it's brown. This is even more brown. 
So there are sometimes only small differences, but this is what makes a rendering realistic. Variations. And the variation shader is easy to use. It has a lot of options for you to choose, but it's not hard to use. Sculpting improvements. With every release, we improve the sculpting. And uh, there are so many changes that I cannot show every single one of them. And I don't want to bore you with the details. I'll just go quickly through the bullet points here. So a lot of changes made it into R17. And these are actually great changes that I think everybody that do or does sculpting um, will take advantage of these. But I go past these bullet points and play the video to explain what I think are the most important features of that. So have a look at this. Sculpt to Postmorph. You want to use Postmorph. Postmorph is to between states of modeling. So for face expressions, like a smile and the normal face. Now you can do them with your, um, with your sculpting. So you create a layer, and on this layer I create or sculpt an angry face, just like that. And it's very easy with the sculpting tools to create these uh, different shape, uh, face expressions. Then I click on Sculpt to Post Morph, and I immediately get a new object. I can delete the old one if I want to, or just make it invisible. And you immediately get this slider, and you can slide between these two poses, just like that, with one click. Uh, stencil tile preview over the whole editor. This is the old version, and this is what's in the new version. So you have a preview of the tiling all over the surface. Or surface distance, this is without the option. Look, both spikes here are moving because there's a radius on your brush. But now, if it calculates the surface, surface-wise, this is too far away. So you can move only this spike. This is great for moving lips without moving the upper lips because upper lip because the surface is too far away. And we've got custom planes now, also pretty cool. You just choose custom plane, and then you control click anywhere, resize it or uh, move it away, even use it with symmetry mode, you can see. And now the sculpting only uh, is sculpted, uh, or the, the mesh is only going until it reaches the custom plane, so you can create surfaces like this here. Also pretty cool. Custom radial symmetry point. This really needs to be explained, otherwise you don't get it. Why is this important? We had symmetry, radial symmetry before, but as you can see here, when I use radial symmetry, I paint one shape and it paints it symmetrical. But I always have to start in the middle. I start anywhere and go outways and then you can see that I always have to start in the middle. And what if I want to create something from the outside? It wasn't possible. So now with the custom uh, radial symmetry point, I control click anywhere. So I define my middle point. And now I can start from outer, from out of the middle. And I can create shapes like circles or whatever. And I don't, you see, nothing is in the middle. Sculpt it. Edge detection, also very cool. Look at this. I reach the edge and the edge is destroyed. So I have to be very careful or I use release 17, edge detection. Look at this. I reach the edge and nothing is happening to this surface here. And it's also the other way around. If I start here, this surface is not affected. Pretty cool. Look at this. I can easily create stuff like this, which wasn't nearly impossible before. So, only a few features. If you want to see the whole list, simply go to a web page and look up sculpting features of R17. Formula shader, it's what it says. You can use formulas now to create shaders. These are just a few examples. And this video also shows it. As you can see here, this is no light. This is actually the formula. Um, the parameter is changed over time here, yeah? which looks like it creates a light on it, each and every surface here. Um, 
The next example is the same. It looks like the sphere creates a light on these cubes, but it actually doesn't. This is the formula creating um, this white image on the surface of the cubes. And you can also, even though the rendering is not that great, but it, it proves my point here, you can see these, this Christmas paper, all the shapes you see here on top of that is done with the formula shader. So just think outside the box how you could probably use that. OpenGL viewport dithering. Oh, I hate bending. Do you know what bending is if you work with graphics? Like when a monitor has bending, this is horrible. We had a bending in our viewport, and this is a visible gradient. This is really disturbing. This is very much zoomed in, so it's an extreme example. And here is a dithered gradient. There are no more colors, but it's uh, through pixel, it's distributed, and there's a transition between these two colors. So have a look at Cinema 4D. You can clearly see the banding here. And this is really annoying when you work in the viewport. And without eating up any performance, it's the standard now in R17, this banding is gone. This is how it looks like in R17. Difference, banding, no banding. So just like that, with R17, it's gone. Material override. This is also actually something that's very small, a small feature, but it saves you a lot of time, or you wouldn't have done it at all, because it's too much work. What does it do? Sometimes you want to have your rendering without um, textures, because you just want to see how the light works in your scene. Is GI correct? Is, are the lights positioned correctly? But the textures will eat so much render time, so you just want to render it without textures to see how the light is distributed. What do you do? You have a scene with hundreds of textures. Of course, you can delete all the textures by hand. How do you put them back? Save your file, probably, or undo this? Too complicated. What if, on top of that, you want to render it without textures, but sometimes surfaces have a transparency, like a window, and you want to preserve that because you have a house with windows. If you delete your textures, you cannot see inside the house because the window as well has no texture, so it's not transparent anymore. Not possible for you. Otherwise, you go into every single texture and delete the color or the texture, but keep the transparency. This will take hours. You wouldn't do that. In the render settings, now you have the material override. Create a custom material, drag and drop it into the custom material field, and in the end, with just three clicks, five seconds, I guess, you have this rendering and that rendering. And you save a lot of rendering time, just to have a look how your rendering works. Another example on this video that explains it much better. I have this nice watch here, and with the material override, you see, looks nice, but now I want to see it without textures. I activate material override. I create a custom material, can be any material, and just drag and drop it into that field. And I also can exclude materials, so some materials are rendered if you want them to stay there. Now the problem is, you can see, I can't see the watch face, it's gone, because this was glass, it was transparent, and alpha channel also here is gone. Now I go into my settings and I preserve transparency, bump, normal, displacement, and alpha, so it still renders like a clay rendering without textures, but now my watch face, the hands are there, and the alpha channel as well. So with just a few clicks, and it saves a lot of time here. And here are the examples. So a small feature again, like I said, a workflow release that saves you a lot of clicks and a lot of time. New OBJ import-export. And really, this is totally new rewritten from scratch, because we found out that OBJ is still the most used export and import format when people work together. So we thought we have to rewrite it, because our old 
OBJ import export doesn't ha didn't have a lot of features. So what we have now is, let's go quickly through it. OBJ import. We now have presets for 3ds Max files. We have geo geometry support for negative indices, polygons, triangle, quads, and gons. We have even transform in the import settings without having uh, imported anything yet. It's just the dialog. You can access flip and do swap options or have swap, swap options. Um, material assignment modes. And also supported is some material options, grouping options, UVs options, normal options, material selection text for material assignment per phase, and channel support. So a lot of options there that haven't been there before. And also the same for export. It's not all the features that you have for import, but nearly the same. Like you see here, polygons, triangles, qu quads, and n-gons. Axis flip and swap options, normal options, material assignment modes, and material options, grouping options, UVs options, channel support, yeah. So a lot of options with the OBJ import export. So people that collaborate and work together have now even more features and can work better if they exchange materials and models. When it comes to models, there's also something new, SketchUp support. Do you know SketchUp? There are hundreds, if not thousands, of objects on the internet, SketchUp objects, that are just waiting for you to pick them up. Because why would you model everything by hand, which takes hours, if you have these objects lying there and you can grab them and use them in your scene? Because people already have done that. They modeled it for you. So the SketchUp support gives you a whole library that you can now directly load objects into Cinema 4D, and then you can use all the Cinema 4D features like texturing, lighting, and everything that you need to use all these hundreds of objects. So great feature that saves you, again, a lot of time because the objects are there. IOR presets, again, time saver. In the transparency channel, we now have a drop-down menu and now you've got all these different settings because every transparency is different. Glass, diamond, uh, jade, milk. And so you don't have to find the right setting. They are already there. So you find the right transparency IOR setting for your material. New meter ball features. This is also pretty cool. Look at this. I didn't use the meter balls before very much. Sometimes when you found something where you could use them, but with these new features, it's pretty awesome. Triangle is the new mode, and look what it does. It looks like you can melt two objects together now, and you get a new welding surface, a welding point around the object. So you can put like two objects together like two metal objects, and you get a welding around that. So you can create these cool objects here. I mean, look at this. The transition between these two objects, it's perfect. It looks so cool and so, so nice and clean and smooth. So this is another way for you to model. And here, the new mode line gives you this opportunity to create lines. Every edge is a line now. Look at this. This is the old uh, metaball mode. So this is not usable for the stuff that you can do now, like modeling, putting objects in uh, into each other. So quickly, in just a few sec uh, seconds, I create this object here. And look at this transition here. You can even change that. So if I use exponential fall off, you can get an even better transition between these objects and create different objects. And that's also very cool. Look at this. Accurate normals is also new. So you can see now you have a very smooth and accurate surface on metaballs. Metaballs in the past look very distracted and they had uh, some 
not a smooth surface, but now with the accurate normals, it's clean, it's really nice and smooth. Motion tracker. We put two very important things and added them to the motion tracker now. Um, the motion tracker, with the motion tracker, it's very hard to find bad tracks. You had to find them by yourself and by, by looking at, oh, sorry. <laughs> We come later to that. Um, I just wanted to play the video, actually, but this sometimes does a double click, so I'm sorry for that. No, I cannot. Now it's working, yeah. So let's have a look at this. It's very hard to find bad tracks because you can't actually see them. And you want to get rid of bad tracks, so you're tr motion tracking is as accurate as it can get. So with the now top-down mode here, you can see directly bad tracks because they are marked red. And you can select them and delete them out of your motion tracking. We also have the graph mode, and you can see there are a lot of graphs here. And this is actually a bad track, but how do you find it? If I don't select it, there are so many graphs here. So what I do is I select a specific part to find bad tracks and then I hide the unselected tracks. Now you can see where the most graphs are distributed. You can be sure that these are good tracks and this one that is out of the range of the others and it has a different direction. This mostly is a bad track. So you select it and delete it. And what you also can do is you can use the filter. You can see these are the good tracks and these are bad tracks. You just filter them out. Use this red, this red handle and move it down. And all bad tracks that are above the good tracks are filters. They are just gone. You have different modes here that you can choose to find these bad tracks and to find these 2D tracking errors. And we also have a trim function, for example, move the time slider and everything before that of this bad track is trimmed. And we also put in lens distortion. Why do we need to get rid of lens distortion? Like when you do your footage and you have a specific lens like a fish eye, straight lines like this one are curved because it's a fisheye lens. Fisheye is an extreme example. So you want to get rid of that because when the lines are straight, the motion tracker algorithm can calculate much better. So what I do here, I use my footage and I take one frame or one picture and then I create these lines and you can see they are curved. I follow this curve of every line where I know this actually is a straight line. This shouldn't be curved. And I put as many lines into my scene as I can find in the scene. So if I find a line that is curved, but I'm sure it should be, I put a line there and with control you can add more points. Then you choose a model, click calculate, and you can see the lens distortion is gone. In the end, you save your lens profile and that's the great thing. With your camera and lens, you only have to do this once in your lifetime. Because every footage you do with this lens, you've saved your lens profile. So you just load it for every other footage you do with this lens later. Let's load your lens profile and you can use it with every footage that has the distortion, if it's the same lens. And you can give it to other people if you want to. It's a file yeah, that you can distribute. So we also have a, a shader now, so you can use it as a shader. Load the lens profile, put it on a background object, and the lens distortion is already gone. And we also have a post effect. And you can use 3D objects now on original distorted um, footage. Have a look at this. In the, lens, uh, in the render setting, I create this lens distortion. I load my lens profile that I created before. It's called living room in this case. And now when I render these 3D objects, they have the same distortion 
as my original footage because I loaded this lens profile. Now look at the rendering, the same curvature. So it, if you do it right, this is not the right light, but if you do it right, these 3D objects look like they were filmed because they have the same distortion. But you can, of course, do it the other way around. Get rid of the distortion so your original footage is undistorted, has straight lines, and then put the orig original renderings on top of that, which also have straight lines. You so you can do it that way, and you can do it that way. It de uh, depends on what you want to do. So this is what I actually uh, destroyed now, the, the gag at the end of the lens distortion, so that you don't get dif um, dif um, diffused. This is no lens distortion, and I couldn't help but trying it because it looks like a lens distortion, like, like a big nose when you're too close to the camera. And I wanted to see how good our algorithms are. So I put lines that calculate this here around. I put a line here and put points here around this belly to see can this algorithm actually calculate it out. And yes, it can. So if you want to get rid on photos of the big beer belly that you created over years, you can get rid of this even with Cinema 4D to look slim. Yeah, great algorithm. So does any of you remember the polygon pen? This awesome and great tool that we put into Cinema 4D that really reinvented modeling for Cinema 4D. It was so, so many great tools in one tool that helped so many people. Modeling makes it so easy to model in Cinema 4D. I use it all the time now. I wouldn't model without the polypen anymore. So we thought, of course, for the next release, we have to do the same for, not for polygons, but for, who knows it? Splines, of course. Splines. I never use splines because they weren't intuitive. I click, I create a point of a spline, and then to create the right shape, it was really hard. So I stayed with polygon modeling. But now we really redid the whole spline thing. And I can assure you, it's incredible now. I have a lot of fun now modeling with splines, and I never used it before. So look at this the new spline tools. We have the spline pen, and we have a sketch, spline sketch. And this is actually very cool, because when you sketch a spline, and you're in sketch mode, you create a spline with just one stroke on your Wacom tablet. And then you see, no, the stroke doesn't have the real shape that I wanted, because you're, you're like a painter. You want to create it with one stroke, and then it doesn't fit the shape you want to have. Then you paint over the just created spline, and it doesn't create another spline. It just repaints the already existing spline. And if you start in the middle of the spline, so the spline is that long, and you start here and end here, it just repaints the middle of that spline, and the rest stays from the first stroke you did. So you can really work like an artist, like repaint it and do as many strokes as you want until the spline has the stroke you want. This is the sketch tool. We have spline smooth which is actually a, li bi uh, a little bit misleading because smooth is only one thing and we've got six other altering modes with smooth, these are seven, to alter your spline. Cool tools you will see in the video. And of course, you need an arc tool. Like with the polypen, we included an arc tool. So let's have a look at the video so we can see these awesome additions. And hopefully, I click only once. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> Please. Yes, no, it works. So look at the spine tools. I used the pen at first, and now look what I do. I click and drag so I can create a shape while I'm dragging. And you always get a preview. Look at these arrows. When you move a point, it's on the fly. When you move a point, you get a preview of the shape. So you see how the shape was before? Look at this. And how the shape will look like. If you double click, 
it uh, straightens the tangents. So really a great and easy way to create your shapes. Look at this. I click, click, click. Then I break the tangents, move them, or I double click there, whatever I want to do. It's just a few seconds, and I get this object here. A nice polygon object with, with just a few clicks. Now smoothing. Oh my god, I wanted this for years. You sometimes have splines that have uh, th that are distorted or have spikes you want to get rid of. Do this by hand. Click on the points and move them. Horrible. With a smoothing tool, you just wipe over it and it smooths everything out. Great feature. You can see also we now have a projection. You can project a spline on a polygon object so it gets the shape of the polygon. Or you can create spirals now, just like that. I mean, you can't do this by hand. Um, this is the spine sketch I was talking about. You can see you also get a preview of the line and now wipe over it and it just creates a new uh, transition between these two um, uh, mountains. As you can see, when I wipe over it. And these are the arcs. The arcs. Control click and you can um, cut a spline into different pieces and then just create arcs like that. In a few seconds you have this object. If you click on two objects then you can combine them to one arc. This is also pretty cool. And there are six ways to alter your arc depending on where you click. Look at where I click and drag. So there's total different behavior if I click on this line, if I click on a point, if I click on this middle area, if I click on the middle point. So there are six ways to change the arc and its behavior. And Boolean operations, also very nice. We had Boolean operations before, but you can uh, could always use only splines. This is not very helpful. We want more splines to join together. So now you can use as many splines as you want. Look at this. I put three splines together, and now I use spline subtract, and I get this shape very easily. Imagine the possibilities if you have different splines and you want to subtract one from another. And this is union, so they unionize together, and you get this shape. So a lot of tools. If you haven't uh, tried out R17, grab the demo version, play around with the spline tools, I can assure you it's a lot of fun and suddenly you look on your watch and it's, oh my god, it's 12 o'clock. So really, a lot of fun using these. Um, let's see, oh, now we come to the big feature. You remember in the beginning I was talking about something people wanted, it's only a small side feature? Sorry, I had to do this because people were asking for this for many years. So, hallelujah, it's finally in our next release. So be prepared for the incredible and you probably have now a question mark above your head. Take system. Okay. What's a take system? And what's a token system? I will explain it, of course. So, what is the take system? This is not the render layer. The take system is actually save different states of a scene in a single file. If you just put it into one sentence. You don't get it yet, I know. And second, it's render layer. So what does it do? With the take system, you create overrides. So you have the main take. If you activate the take system, you have the main take, and then you create a new take, and probably a new take. And you see there's a hierarchy. So I can create a new take that goes here, that has this as a parent, or you can create a new take that has the new take one as a parent. And this is important. So what can you do with this? I have my main take, my scene is finished, everything is fine, I have a table, I have fruits laying on the table, everything is finished. Now I create a new take and change the color of the table. As soon as I go back to my main take, the table is red, like it was before, 
And if I click on this, the table is green because I created an override for the color of the table. Now I create another tick where I change the color again or change the light. You can change any parameter. You can change it all or make an override for nearly every parameter in Cinema 3D. So I change the light here. And then you make like 20 different versions of your scene. What you would have done without the take system is you change the color to green, save it on your hard drive. You change the light because the customer wants different light situations, wants different colors of whatever objects, want different objects on the table. So all these files, you make the change, and then you save it on your hard drive. And we all know customers. What happens in the end? The customer says in the end, OK, I take all these renderings. They are all awesome. But I didn't notice at the beginning. I'm very sorry about that, but it's a customer. You have to do it. I hate the floor. Please exchange the floor for all the renderings, and then you're good to go. And you're going crazy. Because you have to exchange the floor in every of the 20 files that you've already saved. What do you do? You open file number one, exchange the floor, which takes you probably 10 minutes or whatever. And then you open the second file and exchange the floor. And you do it with every single file until you reach file 20. And five hours later, the floor is exchanged. No longer with the tick system. Because you created an override for the objects on the table, or for the color of the table, or for the light, and not for the floor. So if the customer, in the end, wants you to exchange the floor, you can see there's a hierarchy. If you haven't changed the floor here before, make it made an override, you can change the floor on the main take. So exchange the floor on the main take, and all the other takes that already have the changes, like green color, different objects on the table, they also have the new floor because they always have what the main take has because this is the parent. So you change the floor only once and the other takes don't need to be changed. The floor is already exchanged and this is awesome. This saves you a lot of hours of work. And don't forget, if you have a scene that has two gigabytes, you save your scene another time with all these objects and then it's four gigabytes. Do this 20 times, and you've got 40 megabytes on your hard drive eating up your hard drive. With this system, it's only two gigabytes, and it stays like that, because what you're saving and what you're changing is only parameters, but not the whole objects over and over again. So you all also save hard disk space. So look at this. What we also have is an auto take. So normally, Everything is grayed out. If you want to create an override for a parameter, do a right click, say override, and then it's not grayed out anymore. You can change the parameter. But we also have the auto mode. If you activate that, you can change any parameter. And as soon as you change something, it recognizes it and creates an override for you. But be careful with this. Accidentally, you change something, probably. So the changes can be everything. Look at these pictures here. I have my tomato here with different colors. I have my tomato here because I want to give my customer an overview. Do you think this texture is good or this? Or does the tomato have to look like this? Or different light situations, different light moods. You can see here, I change my light moods with every new take I create. And I don't care what needs to be changed in the end because I have my versioning with this take system. So everything is saved in one single file, and in the end, everything is also rendered in one go. And here comes the big thing. You can, of course, use it with render queue and team render, and on top of that, it's also render layer. And this is something that is incredible. Why? Is it render layer? You can see in Cinema, you can create different render settings, and you can stack them up. Create as many render settings as you want. And now you can, can um, use one render setting with new take one, and the second render setting with new take two. So it can assign a render settings to different takes. 
And if you use a compositing tag on objects, you can now say, I render with take number one, the tomatoes, with red color. The second take renders the tomatoes with the green color. So you render them without shadows because you want to have render layers. You want to use a compositing program like After Effects afterwards. So render the tomato without shadows in different colors. Then you render one take with only the shadow and then another take with only the mask. And you do this just in one render take. Let's look at this. This is the token system. It automatically renames everything. So we have a token system here that automatically creates folders and puts every single rendering, every layer, into the right folder so you can find it with the right naming so you don't have to search for the right render layers. Look at this video and this will probably answer all the questions you might have now in your head. A very easy example. I have this scene here and I want to render it with this sofa and then with this chair and I want to render this chair with this wooden floor and then with the concrete floor and I also want to render this sofa with this wooden floor and the concrete floor. So let's have a look what I'm doing here. I have this main take where all these objects are inside. Then I create a take where only the chair is visible and then I create another take where I have a concrete floor. The concrete floor is a child of the chair take, so it has the chair but a concrete floor. And the sofa, if I render this take, has the wooden floor and this one has the sofa with the concrete floor. So in the end, I can render four different states now. The first one here, you can see sofa with concrete floor, the next one is sofa with a wooden floor. The next take is concrete floor with a chair. And the chair take is the chair with the wooden floor. So four different takes, just like that. And you can switch between them. I can also use the take system. I said nearly every parameter with animations. Look at this animation. The, um, the ball was going through that. Now it's falling from above. So you can even have different animations and change them and save them in every take. So let's look at the scene. Main take is a red bowling ball. The second take is a blue bowling ball. And the next take is, you can see, one is rendered with shadows, but the object itself is not rendered. So this is my render setting for having rendered only shadows without the objects. And then the other way around. The next take is without shadows, but only the objects, without the shadows. So now I have my token system. You can see it has the project name, it has the take name, and I have the main RGBR image saved there. And you can do it for every single take here. And these are my four different render settings. You can see they are red, blue, shadow, and the mask take. I assign my render settings to these different takes and now I render, if you want to use it, you can use the render, team render. Now I render it in one take. You can see all four renderings going just in one take. And now look at your hard drive. You have this folder, open up the folders. They are all sorted. Now look at the pictures. First take, blue color. Second take is the mask. The next take, red color, and the next take is only shadows. You can directly take this folder, drag and drop it into After Effects, and you've got all your render layers right there. They are there. You don't have to search for them. You don't have to fiddle around with saving them one by one, finding them, sorting them. Everything is done in Cinema 4D with this incredible take system. I think now you get how it saves you many hours of time. So I have to hurry up here now. So let's look at the other features here. The content library is now also um, added with lots of objects, around 150 changes and additions. So you have a lot of objects. I quickly go through this video here.
a lot of objects that also save you time because you can use these objects um, and they have different settings so you can change the size, the height. Um, if you have a cupboard, you can change how many shelves are in there and so on and so on. And for example, you can open stuff and close stuff and many, many different objects that you don't have to model by yourself. I go quickly through this because we don't have so much time now to look at this. Here's the shelf where I've changed the parameters to make it fit my needs. The bookshelf generator as well. And procedural surfaces, HDRIs, and so on. The bookshelf generator, also something I go through quickly. Simply select polygons on any object, and then you create these books. And you can see I have many options here to create hundreds of books. I can uh, distribute them in many different ways. I can rotate them, make them go forward, and so on. And in the end, this is the example. This was, this was created with the bookshelf generator. Um, you can see even you can throw textures in there, and they're distributed automatically. So you don't have to give every single book a different texture. It's automatically distributed. So every book has a different size, a different texture, different color, and so on. Very cool tool. There are a lot, a lot of animation enhancement. I mean, look at these changes. A lot of, like the Euler filter to get rid of gimbal lock, or uh, like um, um, the tangents to uh, they behave differently now. So you can. Um, get rid of overshoots, for example, and stuff like that. So people that animate, we listen to our customers, and we implemented so many features here. This is page number one. This is page number two. So look it up on the internet. If you're an animator, you will be very happy, because there are a lot of, a lot of changes in this release when it comes to animating stuff in Cinema 4D. And just a small thing just done on the side R16, if this character is here in your scene and you select all the objects, you have in R16 15 frames and in R17 111 frames per second. So huge speed improvement as well. I don't think we can watch this video here right now. It's also in the internet, watch it there. We have a Houdini integration. Also, like SketchUp, load Houdini assets. So Houdini engine is uh, working in the background, so the calculation of this animation here, this dynamics calculation, fluids, whatever, is done in the background, but can, you can use it inside of Cinema 4D natively, and then you can use all the Cinema 4D features, settings, renderings, whatever, in Cinema 4D, but you use an asset of Houdini. So Houdini is working together very closely with Cinema 4D, a very huge improvement. And some internal changes. OpenGL is on version 3.2. Python is on 2.7. So a lot of options here. But again, because I have to hurry up, look it up on the internet. So thanks a lot for coming to my presentation here. I'm really happy about this release because we really got rid of some of the issues that Cinema 4D had in the past when it comes to workflow, because people need to work fast. We always take care of easy use of Cinema 4D and a great workflow and stability. And this won't change in the future, because we want you to be happy with the software, and hopefully you are with this release when you work with this. Grab the demo version. It saves you a lot of time. And thanks for coming. Thanks for watching. Have a great day on the IBC. Thank you.